And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Marie Diamond, energy master and expert teacher on the law of attraction and feng shui. She is the star of the worldwide phenomenon, The Secret, and she's had a near-death experience. Marie, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored. Well, we're excited to have you. And if you don't mind, before we get into feng shui, can you tell us about your NDE? Yes, of course. So I was 15 years old. I was driving home from school with my bike, what everybody does in Belgium, where I'm from. And so I was run over by a truck and um, I was thrown really like 50 meter further on all pebbles and I hit completely my face and my head. And um, so then they called an ambulance, of course, and they declared me dead. So they already had put a fabric over me. And thank God, um, one of the teachers from school saw what had happened and drove very fast to my mom that we were just living around the corner, literally. And so my mom rushed to the scene and start begging that they would try to revive me again. So they put me in the ambulance and and run, you know, drove to the hospital. I don't know how long that was, but the only thing I did remember was that I was hanging above my body and I was seeing my mom in the ambulance and I was like, what is she doing here? I mean, I was driving by myself, so she couldn't be there in my consciousness. And then I looked at the ambulance guy that was trying to revive me. And I was like, I'm 15 years old, but I'm thinking, oh my God, he's so cute. (laughs) He had blonde curly hair and blue eyes. And later on, I confirmed that with my mom. That's exactly how he looked like. But I was was like flatlined, right, at that time. And so at that moment, I left my body and um, I left the ambulance also. And I went through all these dimensions um, it's like almost like taking an airplane and going to the clouds and going to again to the clouds and more to the clouds, like till I was in total pure white light. And I was also in pure white light. I, I, I looked at myself like, oh, this is different. And there were nine beings of light sitting there. And I don't know what they really were, if they were masters or angels or representations of God, but there was very clear there were nine. And I heard this voice, and the voice said to me, uh, you need to go back. You are here to enlighten more than 500 million people. And so I was like, the next thing I remember was three days later when I woke up out of a, a deep coma. So apparently they <laughs> revived me, right? And so um, and at that moment, what was very interesting was like I was in the ER, or like a special unit from the ER. And and it was all light still, but I I didn't have my glasses on anymore. So I couldn't see very well who was really there. Were there still the same beings? Because they're in Belgian hospitals, doctors are dressed in white and nurses too, not in green like in the US. And so I was like, are they still the same beings that are running or walking there? I had like no idea. And, but I felt the sheets of the hospital bed. I'm like, oh, I feel something I didn't feel on the other side. And then, you know, they saw I woke up and my mother came and she was like, um, I felt all this pain in my face. So what had happened is from falling on uh, all pebbles, my whole face was ripped off, right? So all the skin was gone and like all the different layers. And so, they, she said, Marie, they told me we need to have plastic surgery. And I said very clearly, we're not going to do that. I'm going to heal myself. Now, you have to understand I'm from a Catholic background. <laughs> Nobody heals themselves. But Jesus heals you, right? Or the stains to Mary or something, right? And so I was very clear. And so I was like, what? And I'm like, you are not signing off on this. Yeah. And I was just putting my hands on my 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 face just vibrating love. I was just thinking love, 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 right? I felt so much love in me after that experience that I kind of vibrated that to my face. And three weeks later, I had a completely recovered face. And I always laugh with that because I'm like, you know, I'm 60 and a lot of people think I'm much younger and said, well, I had a new face at 15. 
<laughs> so uh, that's kind of my near-death experience. Well, that was a miraculous healing because you are a beautiful woman and your face looks completely normal. Yeah, there's still a few little things, but like you normally, you know, you can't see it. And I, I, I really, I remember seeing, looking at the mirror and I looked really like, you know, it was bare, bare uh, flesh, right? So it's really, yeah, it was, but I do feel that it was like that energy that I got on the other side. Um and of course, you know, um, by later on being directed to be the only European in the secret, which is secret to reach more than 500 million people. So I need to come back just perhaps to be in the secret. You never know. When I was researching you, another thing that I noted is that you even were noticing or sensing energy at a very young age. Which was more impactful for you later in life? Was it the NDE or you were already sensing energy earlier? Well, you know, I, I could see energy. I could see spirits, uh, you know, people that had passed on. I could see when people were going to uh, die. I, I told my mom, this person is dying tomorrow. Like, I could see the chakras, but I had no idea what that all meant, right? So for me, was it more impactful? I think it was such a normal thing. Like it was like my daily experience. So I don't see it as impactful. It was like part of who I was. But I would say around my 14, I kind of started losing some of that information. So I felt like the ND kind of catapulted me back in it. Yeah. And after that near death experience, I was completely connected again with it. Yeah. And um, and I used it completely after that. So I would say from an impact, the reawakening, right, of this, the NDE was probably more impactful. The rest was just like my normal self. As you know, you were only 15 when it happened. Did you become a very spiritual person that young or did it take years to process and you changed over time? No, it, it was like very early on. You know, I had, when I was young, I had visitations of, beings of light already. So when I had this experience with um, on the other side, I was like, oh yeah, there they are again, you know? So it was not like so abnormal for me. And, um, you know, I, I saw beings sometimes come to me, like suddenly seeing them in front of me and they were like talking to me telepathically. Um, and when I was seven, I had my spiritual master show up in my life and he was an immortal as we call that an ascended master and so he started teaching me so he would come in i don't know how often but like i don't have time on level on that but he would come in and teach me something on meditation and i started really clearly doing my meditation when i was seven years old and so doing daily practice of what he had learned what he had taught me at that time and so for me, that was like part of my life. So that I had then I saw these beings on the other side. It was like, oh yeah, right. They're there now, but they've always been connected with me before. So as your life progressed forward, how did you wind up being on the secret? So yeah, so you know, after being um during the NDA, like I had this message, I had to, you know, impact so many people. So, you know, at that time there was in my country no spiritual teachers really or self-help but that, that was just not existing publicly i'm sure it was existing but not that i had access to it so i was thinking how can i make a difference so i thought if i become a diplomat and i start working for the government and work for the U united nations like something like on a humanitarian level so i could really make a difference so i became an international lawyer and I started working for the Belgian government, later on for the European government, to start changing law systems and to, you know, negotiate uh, with governments. So for me, that was like, this is my direction to be a diplomat, because I had no other idea how to do this, right? And so, but after my near-death experience, I reconnected with my spiritual master, and I asked him what I did do wrong that I attracted this. Of course, this is part of my destiny. But he said laughingly, he said, Marie, you have bad feng shui. And this is actually the first time I encountered the word feng shui. And of course, I started looking for books on feng shui that were not available in my language at all at that point. 
And so I start just, you know, the things that he told me that I need to change bedrooms, change colors, change direction. So he kind of gave me some basic information. And I just kept practicing that with, you know, really good results. My life, I healed and I uh, encountered a lot of positive changes in my life. My career went like crazy fast moving forward. But, you know, at 26 and a half, I had another experience that uh, is not an NDA, but is what we call an enlightenment experience. So I was went in a total state of oneness with the universe. And when that happened, when I came back, I was still a lawyer, but I was like, you know, enlightenment before, you know, it's like, you know, do the wash before you get enlightened and you do the wash after you get enlightened. But I was a lawyer before and I was a lawyer after, right? So, but my whole um, experience shifted completely of being totally without judgment and totally feeling in oneness and love with everybody. And so that at 31, I decided like, this is not my path to change human uh, humanity through law of the physical world, but perhaps to use the spiritual laws. And so I became a spiritual teacher, so teaching people about meditation, about spirituality, about how to reach enlightenment. So I started having a, a lot of students at 31 already. So, but then I still felt it was just, people were still not really embodying everything. And I started bringing in from way more, started studying in Malaysia with a grandmaster. And I became really certified as a feng shui master. And then when I was 38, I thought like, you know what? Um, I'm still not getting to these millions of people because Belgium is only 10 million people, right? So I need to move to a big country. And I was indicated by my master to go and live in the US. And so that's what I did. And you know, literally within a few months, I had a lot of high-end clients that, you know, were directed to me and came and found me. And um, I started teaching feng shui and meditation. And one of these clients was Jack Canfield, um, you know, the, the author of the Principles of Success and also the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. Right. And he started a mastermind group and he wanted me to be part of it. And so I was like, but I'm a total unknown at that time. And all the other people in the mastermind were people that have sold millions of books, but he was very adamant that I need to be there because he he knew already from who I was and my light and my love for people. And, um, and that's where actually the secret was filmed. The third time we came together in the mastermind. Um, and I literally got a dream a few weeks before that I would meet a woman with half blonde hair and that she would ask me something as she was going to be from Australia and I had to pay attention. So two weeks later, we were sitting in the mastermind and she comes sitting next to me, this woman with half blonde hair, she said, hey, I'm Rhonda Byrne from Australia. I'm not doing the Australian accent. And so she was like, I'm doing this movie and I'm filming people. And I said, oh, I pay attention. I'm interested. Now, at that moment, I had never been in front of a camera. So this was my first interview ever in front of a camera. And so, and when I, she chose me to be one of the people that was in the movie and for sure um, that reached millions of people. This is actually the short version of how I got into the movie. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing with us. When you were, you were speaking about feng shui and I thought it's merely just the art of decorating your house. But when this guy told you your feng shui was wrong, I feel like it's much more than that, like something to do with your energy. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. So it's not so much about the interior design. I mean, interior design will be, it's great, we can work with that, right? But so based, and there's something I learned later on, is that based on your um, birthday, and your birth gender, you create like an energetic profile. And people can find that out in the book Feng Shui Your Life that, um, that is available in good bookstores on Amazon, but also through my free app. So it's a free app you can put in Marie Diamond and they will be able to calculate your energy number. So what I understood is that there are nine, um, nine numbers, nine types, we call it archetypes, how you are accessing the quantum field. And so feng shui is really a way how to go from your three-dimensional field 
into the quantum field. And so when we are able to know our portals into the quantum field, and we activate that, and there is a portal for your success and money, there's a portal for your relationships, there's a portal for your health and well-being, and one for your spiritual connection. Once you are aligning everything around you so that these portals are open, then it's easier for you to, first of all, connect with the quantum field, but also for the quantum field to provide for you what you want to manifest. So when I found that out, that was just such a huge shift for me because most people have access to the quantum field through spirituality, yeah, through their intuition, through their um, alignment, through prayer, through rituals that they're doing. And so that is a way to connect with the quantum field. Another way to connect with the quantum field is to your mindset, to um, your emotions of gratitude, to actions of higher frequencies that you're taking. But there's also the third part, and that is your environment, because your environment is part of that quantum field. It looks very three-dimensional, it looks very structural, but it's still part of your energy. And so what happens is that when you are able to tap into that energy system, because feng shui is really an energy system, it's not interior design. It's like I compare it with like uh, when you do acupuncture or you do tai chi or qigong or even yoga, you're moving the qi, you're moving the vibration, you're tapping into frequencies. Now the body, you can do that, but you have a bigger body around you. That's your home. So that is also, we are focusing on the energy points based on your birthday that really open up the chi for you to connect in with the quantum field. So once I understood that, I was like, oh, that makes total sense. And my grandmaster of feng shui always told me that that's the last part that people are not tapping into. They know it, they feel it, they go to certain places and they're like, oh, the vibe is off. I don't like it here. Yeah. So like last night I, I was invited to go and present an award somewhere. And I was like, the vibe was just so bad, right? I wanted to leave within five minutes, but I could. I had to stay till the end because I had to give the last award, right? So, but there are other places we come there and we're like, oh my God, this is so amazing. I love this place here. You just don't know, but there is a bigger access to that quantum field. So feng shui masters in China have for thousands of years found there are, I would say, laws of uh, like spiritual laws, but then quantum laws for the environment that we can practice to, to unify that uh, connection between our body, mind, and spirit and the quantum field also through your home. And when I understood that, I was like, what? That was a major breakthrough for me. And I knew that was going to be something I'm going to share. And then other people in the rest of the world were sometimes tuning into that quantum field through dowsing. Yeah. So looking where are the ley lines. And so, you know, in cathedrals, temples, um, sometimes um, buildings like in the United States, the Capitol Hill, the White House, you know, all these, the Masons at the time, they were very aware of all this. And um, they would then make sure, or for palaces even, they would look for these positive lines. And when you are in a crossing of such a positive line, you create what we call a delta point, an awakened delta point. So if you sit on it or you do rituals on it, you have a direct uh, connection that with the quantum field. So some some um, I would say cultures would look more towards feng shui, others would do dowsing. But in China, they practice both. They practice both at the same time. So the palaces of the emperors were both based on the timing of his birthday of an emperor, but also on making sure that the place where the emperor would sit would be on such an awakened delta space. If we get back to your personal energy number, how is that different from your numerology or your birth number? But it's not adding up the numbers like what you do in numerology. So this is actually connecting with your... It's a whole calculation. So there's a calculation behind it. Like when people go and find it out on the app. So, and it depends also when you're born, like in January, February, because of the Chinese New Year. So it's not adding up like the typical year calendar, right? Because we're working with the moon calendar. 
in Chinese um, astrology. But also it depends differently, like when you're born before 2000 or before, if you're born after 2000, it will be a different calculation. Every hundred years is a different calculation. So, and it's also connected with your gender. So it's connected ultimately with your DNA. And so they found out that there are <clears throat> different wind directions, chi directions that are connected with that. So it ultimately gives you a profile, but it also gives you, and that's what is very important for us, it gives us a way to uh, look at the direction of your home. So for example, mine is Southwest. So in my office, in my bedroom, in, my, in every space I work, live and sleep, where I'm spending a lot of time, I need to activate that portal. So as it's Southwest for me, in my office, I'll put my books there, put contracts there, put my awards there. So you always align like what your wishes are, what you want to do there. So it's not just to know your profile, is you need to apply it into your environment. In my relationship direction, in my office will be different than my relationship direction in my living room. Because in my living room, that's where my family, my friends hang out. In my office, that's where my clients are, right? My colleagues are. So you also have to activate it differently per room that you're in. Now we can go much more advanced in it. And we have something called time feng shui. So we actually can then see what do you need to change for each Chinese astrology year. And even per month, there are some small changes. So it's like really acupuncture. We put something, but we can then add a color. We can add a little symbol, an element to it so that your vibration is always accessible to the quantum field on a hundred percent level. Do you think that we choose this personal energy number pre-birth before incarnating? Yeah, I do. I do believe that. Yeah. So I do believe that. Um, and I've seen this, like when people look at it and they look at their profile and they're like, my God, this is who I am. But not just the characteristics. It's also how you are attracting certain jobs, how you will relate with um, in relationships, what kind of, um, spirituality or religious experiences um, or beliefs that you will attract? What are the things that are good for your health? So it's really like a whole profile and people are always stunned how accurate it is and then how you can activate it. Because a lot of people, they're, they're tapping into it at birth, but then, you know, they don't really practice it. And so just the shifts that are happening, even for people that are not even believing in it, like literally, I just was talking to a woman and her daughter was like in the bedroom, um, was totally misplaced. Like you also, the direction of the bed will be depending on it, where you place certain things. And she said, like, I couldn't get that child to sleep with everything I tried. And so I told her, we're going to change your bed. She changed her bed. And now from the first night on, she went on time in bed, slept well. And she's like, Marie, it is like a different child. I said, yeah, because we need to align our body, mind, and spirit through our space that we are living in with the quantum field, with the universe. And so that child was in the wrong place. So it felt very awkward. It didn't feel great. And I have like thousands of um testimonies of people say, I shifted my bed, I shifted my desk, and all these things started happening. Now, I do believe that this is integral part of your, I uh, would say, profile of how you can manifest things. And so this is the missing link that most people have. And so when I understood that from a studying this Chinese energy system, I knew that I had to kind of bring it together in the Western world with the mindset with the brain waves, because your brain waves are even changing very quickly when you, for example, see the door and you face a good direction in your office, your brain wave within a few seconds go to alpha brain waves. We've done so many tests on that. You're sitting with your back to the door and you face the wrong direction. Within a few seconds, you go more into beta brain waves. I mean, even the brain waves changes, right? So it's like it totally shifts our whole being. And it opens us up to who we truly are. And so when I've understood that, I knew that I had to bring the East and Western information together. 
And that is what I've been teaching since 30 years. Well, I think that this is basically your own style of feng shui and you call it diamond feng shui? Correct. Yes. So because I want people to live full, fully, like all the aspects of their life, right? And so some people are focusing on relationships. For me, I focus on the four pillars of a happy life, having success and having abundance, like whatever that means for you, it's for everybody different, uh, having good relationships, having great health and well-being, and also be a spiritual human being and doing good for others and for the world. So for me, that are the four pillars. And so we can actually achieve that. And so, and of course it helps when you have a good mindset and it helps when you have spiritual practices. But what my feng shui master said is that a lot of people have all this, but then they don't have it um, become part of their lives. It's not integrating in their lives. It, there's no foundation that is strong. So when we create a good foundation in our space, then it's easier to have the access to a more positive mindset, to have more connection with God. And so I see people, even if they have no idea what their wife or their husband are doing in their home, that suddenly they're opening up because they are aligning more and more with who they truly are and what they're here for. And that is manifesting their soul purpose. What are some of the most common feng shui mistakes that you notice in people's houses? Well, I think the first one is clutter. Yeah. So people are not always aware that, you know, everything is energy, right? If you have all books around you, I mean, books are information. It could be overwhelming for your mind. You think, well, it's just a book, but there's information in the book, right? Or they have clutter where they're sleeping and they're like, well, I don't sleep so well. But, you know, you have a hard time to even get to your bed because there's all clothes on the ground, right? So you have to think in order to really connect in with your source, you need to create space for it. And in order to create space, you need to, you know, let go of things. Yeah. We are in a consumption uh, universe right now in the Western world. But if you look in the Asian uh, traditions, you know, less is really more. And we need to do less of physical stuff. Right. So that's the first thing I always say to people, let go of things, you know, let go of at least 10 to 20% to open the space for the universe, for the quantum field to bring towards you what you have been asking for. So that's the first one I always say. The second one is, like I already shared, is making sure you're always in tune with who is coming into the space that you're in. So like I'm sitting here in my office, I'm talking to you online but you are like sitting on the other side of me. So I want to make sure that there's space on the other side for you. So it's like you're sitting on a chair on the other side of my desk. So that's why you can't have a desk as against a wall because you're literally hitting subconsciously a wall, a wall of creativity, a wall of finance, a wall of you know not connecting with people. So you always make sure you are seeing the door, see people coming in, even if they're energetically just coming in. And that's the door that comes, that you use yourself to get into the space. And that's not your bathroom door. That's not your sliding doors. It's the door coming from the hallway. Set yourself up this way when you're working, when you're talking to people, when you even have meetings outside of your house and make sure there's space on the other side and have something supporting you, a high back chair, a wall could be an image that you feel supports you, like a spiritual image or something that you feel is really helping you. So that is like the first thing we always have to say is set yourself up that you are in connection with the flow of energy of your space. Can you share any other tips with us? Yes, of course. So another tip I definitely would talk about is the bedroom. And that is, you know, a lot of people, especially in the United States, they have mirrored uh, closet space, right? So they want to have more sunlight coming in. They have more, um, they want double the energy. But, you know, in feng shui, we have seen that this is actually affecting you. First of all, at night, people sleep less. They have a harder time to connect in with um, the realms of light. Yeah, when there's mirrors there. And so some of the tests have seen in China that people have more inflammation, have a hard time to lose their weight, um, also feel that they are having higher blood pressure. So 
cover the mirrors during the night with a curtain or put a screen in front of it or remove them. Even a television can be a mirror, right? So you need to put fabric over it. People sleep more calmly when they have that. And then I just want you to think about, and that's your, another tip, walk through your house like you are the universe, like you are God. And you open the door and like, if you would be the eyes of God, what does God see, right? Is it clutter? Are images there that like are all images of solitary human beings? Right. And you're saying like, I'm single, but everything around you is a three dimensional vision board. So it really affects you constantly. And so it's on a subconscious level that you get these messages. Consciously, you're not paying attention to it. But subconsciously, you're all the time saying, yes, I'm OK by being single. And so, so many times when I come in a house and I read a house and I'm like, is this going on in your life? And they're like, yeah, how do you know? I'm like, it's everywhere around you. Right. So people just need to be paying attention to it more and then say, like, this is not who I am. This is not what I want to be. Then replace it. And of course, we work a lot with colors in diamond function. We have specific colors that we're using to really activate. And that's also based on your energy number and the location to really activate the vibration of the space. There's a great story on your website about a painter and relationships. Can you share that one with my audience? Yeah, so that was a painter and um, he had um, around him um, images and he painted that himself, an image of a woman kind of turning himself, turning herself away from the people watching the painting, kind of naked with like just a cloth, you know, to uh, cover her. And um and I said, so how's your love life? And he's like, well, it's not going anywhere. Cute guy. I have to be honest. If I would not have been married, I was going to be interested in the guy. Right? He was very cute. Had a very high level job. And he said, like, it's so bad that tomorrow I have a blind date set up for me. And I'm like, wow. And I said, but look around you. There are seven places in your space. You have this woman that I love painting her. And he said, she's like my ideal woman. I said, yeah, but she looks away from you, right? She's vulnerable. She's naked. So I said, but you're also saying she's alone, right? So I asked him to paint something different. So what he did, he literally started painting um, himself. I said, put you in the picture, right? He said, I want a lot of dates. I said, okay, paint yourself with multiple women. I mean, it's your home. It's your destiny, right? So he did that. And so I saw him again six months later and he said, I'm kind of done with it now, but suddenly all these women start seeing me and want to go out with me. He said, well, now I want a, a very strong relationship. I said, I'll paint a, an image of you and your true love, right? Imagine her. And so later on, within a year, he found her, got married, three kids, and he's still super happy with her. So the whole point is, it's actually what we place around us that is affecting us. And we need to be more careful about that. Do you think manifesting can be independent of feng shui? What I say always is that you can manifest without good feng shui, but it's sometimes harder and more difficult because your home is telling a different story. So if people that are very well known for their manifestation power that are self-help teachers, even people that like The Secret, Rhonda Byrne called me one day and she said, The Secret is not working for me anymore because they do it all with their mindset or their connection with their intuition. And I said, you know, if your home is telling a different story, it will be harder to manifest, yeah? And so what happens is if your home is aligned with what you want to manifest, it will be easier. Now you can get to the top of the mountain with a great mindset and a lot of actions and totally in tune. But at the end of it, you'll be exhausted. It will be harder. Why don't you bring your home in alignment? So to make things easier and effortless, I mean, literally all the things that have happened in my life, of course, I followed my intuition. Of course, I had a good mindset, but things were not always going so easy till I added my feng shui. And then suddenly doors opened and things are happening so much easier 
and I'm not exhausted from all this discipline of always have to do all my affirmations, doing all the time, all my meditations, doing massive actions. It's just like there is an alignment and a flow that most people don't have. And that's really the magic by using feng shui. Do you think that manifesting never ends? Like you always have to keep doing it or it will stop coming to you? It's, it becomes part of who you are, right? And so sometimes I don't even manifest things or think about things, but it's in my space, yeah? Um, I'll give you an example, um, a very funny story. Um, it's like I one day I thought, like, oh, my God, um, I really want to be in this movie seen by millions of people. I put that on my vision board in my success direction because vision boards you put in your success direction. And um, I thought, like, what is like an image that could reflect that? And thought, like, oh, an Oscar. Right. So I put an Oscar out, put my name on it, put like a time on it. And that's actually the year the secret was coming in my life. But, you know, I put there the Oscar, but I had no idea. And I never thought about manifesting people that won Oscars. Yeah. But it was still, I put that symbol out. Yeah. So it was not in my goals to meet people with Oscars. So, but literally, Within a month, I put an Oscar out. Somebody called me and said, you know, I'm a director of a movie. I got an Oscar, but I want you to come to help my family. We're in trouble with the family. The kids, my, hus my, my husband and wife were not doing very well. So I said, okay. So I didn't do this on purpose. And I think we do manifest sometimes things without knowing, right? Because it's just part of life. And so, but then I became aware of it because I started attracting more and more Oscar winners with one Oscar. And then I said one day, let me put three Oscars out. Let me put somebody out that has three Oscars, right? And then within 10 days, I attracted Steven Spielberg that had won three Oscars as one of my clients, yeah? So then I was aware of it. But I think most of the time we are not aware of it. And we're manifesting because we have a thought, because we're talking a certain way, because we were perhaps asked something years ago, we have we've got about yeah and so do we have to keep doing it i said i would say yes if you really want to have a focused life a life focused on well-being focused on happiness we need to be more aware of what we are manifesting if you don't mind sharing with us what are you manifesting right now oh <laughs> i love that well you know when i turned 60 last year I was like, uh, I woke up in the morning with this voice right from the universe. You have to go mainstream. So for me, that was like, you know, I'm very well known in the feng shui world, in the spiritual world, in the self-development world through the secret. But I never thought about going mainstream, right? So I was like, okay, I'm manifesting to go mainstream now. So I, I thought like, okay, I need to make a TV series. So... Uh, then I attracted, um, you know, a business partner. We created a TV series that is airing very soon on a major network. But since then, I've attracted so many radio shows, television shows that are really mainstream. Like um, in a few weeks, I'm invited to uh, for an episode on NBC for open houses. So it's like all these things start coming to me. And what I did is just in my success direction, I put... Um, the symbols of mainstream media, right? So I don't know these people, right? But suddenly they think about, oh, we need to film a feng shui master. And they do research probably. And they're like, oh, we could get her. Let's reach out to her, right? So, but I tell the universe, I'm open. Yeah, when you place something in your success record, you're actually telling, I'm open to this, yeah? And so the last months I have done, I don't know how I'm, I think about 14 or 15 uh, morning shows on Fox TV, yeah? Now, that is mainstream, right? So this is like an audience that I was so very surprised they were even open to talk about feng shui, but they love it. And so that is mainstream. So for me, that is so beautiful and that we can actually help people from all cultures because it's an energy system, you honor every religion in it, you honor every belief, any background, any, any culture can be honored through your home. And so 
that is what I'm working on right now to really get to a mainstream uh, to really share feng shui and how that can change their lives. You mentioned putting an object or a symbol of what you want in your success something. It just wasn't clear for me. What was that? In your success direction by going to the free Mary Diamond app. And so in the, that part of the app is totally free. It stays for free. You put in your birthday, your gender, and you will get videos and information how to use a compass. This is a specific compass that people use. And so I'm just trying to take it right now. Um, and so they will get a compass and the compass will line out what is your success direction. For mine is Southwest. So when I hold the compass in my hand, the Southwest in this room shows behind me. So that's where all the things are placed about my success. So when people start looking what is in their success direction, they have to declutter it. And then they can put books, for example, on success, like your podcast, right? You can put the logo of your podcast there, right? So anything that for you, it's very personal, aligns with your success. If you are a dentist, well, they can perhaps put um, a little statue of a dentist, right? Or you, whatever works for you. And so in, you have also a relationship direction. And in your relationship de direction, uh, in your case, I would put a globe there because you want to connect globally. And I'm sure you have people from all over the world listening to your podcast. Yeah. And so I have always a globe up because I have my students in more than 190 countries. So I need to make sure that I'm always connecting. So what is a better symbol for showing that as a globe? Yeah, because I'm connecting them with everyone. So what you do is your subconscious mind works very well with symbols. Yeah. And so even if you don't are thinking about it anymore, your subconscious mind is still picking up that story that you place there. What if you're married and your spouse's directions are completely different from yours? How do you yeah, compromise on that? Of course you can compromise that. I have that with my husband, right? So what I do then, I choose a space where I spend the most time in. So for me, that's my office. Yeah. So I spend here the most time, like let's say eight, nine hours a day. So I make sure everything is activated in my space where I work the most. I also activate it in my um, bedroom, right? And there I also activate his directions. Yeah. For example, his relationship direction is different than mine. His is northeast, mine is. Uh, West. So I put a picture of both of us, a picture that he likes in his direction, a picture I like in my direction, because it's personal. And then he spends a lot of time in the family room. That's kind of where he works and hangs out the most, you know, to do his work. So I activate everything there for him. Yeah. So because that's where he spent the most time. So I don't activate my bathroom or my kitchen because I don't hang out there three to five hours a day. So always go where you spend the most time and activate it there. On the surface, it seems like it may be complicated, but if they get your book, does it make it easy for them? Yeah, correct. So the book Feng Shui Your Life is literally having me hang by hand, you know, walking through your house with the app, but people need to download the app to make sure it's easier. And there's also another way if you can't download an app, to work with a normal compass and that solution is also placed in the book but with the app it's just much easier and so and i just go through the whole space like you have marie diamond with you to make that happen so then that, that's why it's a beginner's guide but also people that are used to work with feng shui get a lot out of it yeah because this is personal feng shui and a lot of people do bagua mapping this is another level because it's personally based on your birthday well, you mentioned that your TV show is coming out. What is it called and when will it be aired? It's called Feng Shui Your Life. We're waiting for the date at, as we're speaking. So it should be in the spring of 2024 coming out. And what it is, is like I literally go in people's houses and I feng shui their life. So like, for example, this one woman and she um, was looking for a Valentine date. And she um, said, like, I'm a single mom for kids. I haven't had a date in a long time and I really want somebody to take me out for Valentine. So I, I activated her bedroom for romance, but I also activated for um, 
her money because she was really struggling financially. And so within a month, I called her and she said, what happened? Well, she said, I got four men asking me out for Valentine's. So I chose the best one. And then I got a raise. I got an unexpected bonus and I got really an, a next level in my job. So I got um, like another job level. And she said, like, this was amazing by just doing my bedroom. And so what I need to change were the, the images around her, her bed position, the colors. It was just not romantic enough, right? So this is like what we show. We show um, like the interview, I what I see, what's going on. Then we see the changes. And then we see also what has happened. And these are regular people, right? Like you and me that are just, we're going in and they have applied for it. They told what their problems was. And so we go in and we help them, uh, families, single people. So there are eight episodes and I'm very excited to share this with the world. Well, you've also worked with celebrities and if they're not this season, hopefully you'll get celebrities in season two. Yes. Yeah, so we already actually are planning season two and we have some celebrities there, but also I want to keep regular people there because, you know, not everybody has a big mansion and sometimes people are in a studio apartment can you do feng shui there? Yes. Can you do feng shui on any budget? Yes, you can. Of course, the celebrities, they can bring people in. But, you know, sometimes putting a candle or seeing what you have. I always ask people, can I open your, your cabinets? I'm sure there's something there I can use. So you have most of the time some books that we can place just by putting small things you already have and then really working on the budget, sometimes printing something out, you know, that, you know, you want love, but you cannot find like something, a statue of love, but you can print something out and you can hang it out. Yeah. I, I remember I had this one man and he said to me, Marie, I live in a tent. He lived in a tent camp, I was homeless. I said, what can I do? And I said, the only thing I have is I have post-it notes. I said, great. Take the post-it notes, put on it what you want. I said, you know, put in, you know, two hearts, put it there. You know, put money, just put in money and what you want from money, put it in your directions. And so a year later, we connected again. He had a job. He had a love. He had a steady romance and he had a home. And he said, since I did that, suddenly things started happening in my life. And now he goes every Sunday back to the tent camp and is teaching people how to use this with a free app. It's free. You can just practice it and use it. You have to pay $14 for the book. It's not so expensive. There's a lot of information on my YouTube channel. So there are a lot of information on the Instagram. So you just can do a lot for a very small amount of money. And I want people, as I'm going mainstream, I want everybody to practice this and not just giving them the idea that only celebrities can do that. Is feng shui originally from Japan? And no, it's originally from China. Okay, it's a Chinese system. All right. Well, do you think so, do you think that many of the Chinese people practice it? Well, you know, it's really interesting. Is that um, the Chinese information of feng shui was kept to the uh, high level of um, in society? So the emperor the court, the, the ones that were surrounding the emperor were um, known about this. It was actually, there were a few hundreds of years that it was illegal to even share this with the common people. And there was a death uh, sentence on a feng shui master when they shared that information. So that is still today, a lot of the high-end uh, Asian families have their own feng shui master that practice this. And a lot of that information is not shared with the common people. They have like some, what I call popular feng shui. So they do a few little things, um, but that's one of my next things I'm trying to manifest for the next years to go back to China and teach them really that original, you know, the high-end information that they are not knowing about. Yeah. And so that is something that I feel that is also needed again. And I have a lot of Asian clients and I remember in 1994, when my grandmaster came to a conference and were, the other grandmasters were together in the conference. And there were about 100 experts, uh, students coming together. 
And he taught the experts that already knew a lot of feng shui, but not the real secrets, right? He taught them one of the major secrets of feng shui, and the other grandmasters were furious with him. And he said, it's time, he said, that everybody knows this information. And so a lot of that information I'm using and I'm sharing through my classes, through my seminars, through my, my books, so that people would know that that is information still today is in the ancient culture of Korea to Japan to China is kept to the few ones. And I believe everybody needs to know this. If people have questions, can they leave them as a comment on a YouTube video? And if so, will you answer them? Yes, so they can to have questions, the best ones, or to go to the YouTube channel, but also Mary Diamond Official, but also to go to my Instagram, Mary Diamond Official, uh, because there's a lot of every today there are tutorials that have gone, many of them have gone viral. They can also go to the TikTok account. So my team and myself, we're looking regularly. I look every day at the DMs and the questions in the um, um, you know the comments. We we really look into it and we answer as much as we can. And if we see a lot of questions are coming regularly, then we make a tutorial on it. So I just that's part of the generosity that we really want to bring to bring this mainstream. Well, you have the app. You've got the TV show and the book. What else are you working on that you want us to know about? Well, I think really what I'm focusing on the most is now to get this work out. Yeah. So um, I do a lot of interviews right now and I've been honored that I was interviewed by you. And so we really are getting more and more people that are wanting to learn more intensely this information. So we are also uh, launching again our certification program because I want a lot of people to know this information and share this with the world. So we have certified people all over, but you know, this is like one of the major things to make sure we have as much practitioners as possible because I cannot be anywhere, uh, everywhere. So I need to make sure that the possibilities is there for people to practice and share this with the world. Marie, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? One of the things I always say to people every morning, you know, when you wake up, you know, connecting with your vision. That's what I do every morning. Like my vision is here to enlighten more than 500 million people. And I always ask God, the universe, show me how. That's the first thing I do. Show, ask, you know, show you, show how you need to do things, right? And the second question I always ask every morning to God, to the universe, how can I love more? How can I love more myself? How can I love more others? Perhaps this is a beautiful question you can ask yourself every morning. Marie, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you for doing your great contribution to humanity. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.